Um, Ani Bojo Kwekwe, Robin Ron and Dijnakas, Temi Ogaman and Donjaba, Wabi Mekwan and Dodem. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Robin Rowe, and I come to you today from the traditional territories of the Atikamikshing Anishinaabek and the Wanapate Nations here in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. I am Anishinaabe Kwe and a hereditary member of Tamagami First Nation and a, a descendant of the Friday Family Traditional Territories, which is located about two and a half hours uh, northeast from here on an island along the Tamagami River. So we are coming together today, tonight, this this evening from all different corners of the world in this virtual setting that is in so many ways uh, making it easier for us to gather during these really challenging times. And while I would love to be sitting in Edinburgh, Scotland right now, uh, where our wonderful conference organizers have situated this RDA session, I am grateful to be able to gather in this virtual way um, that you know, it wasn't really streamlined even a year ago if you wanted to attend these kinds of conferences from a distance, right? So I want to thank you all on behalf of the International Indigenous Data Sovereignty Interest Group uh, established through the Research Data Alliance and also on behalf of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, so GIDA. This breakout session is called Stewardship of Indigenous People's Data, Use Cases for Repositories and Collections. Over the last few years, members of the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Interest Group and GITA have been actively discussing and pursuing ways of ensuring that the data rights and interests of Indigenous nations around the world are protected. And um, so I'm just making sure we have no feedback, great. And uh, grounded in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, global movements are leading discussions around the world on how to respectfully and appropriately govern Indigenous information. So whether that has to do with information on land or our territories or our resources, our people or our nations, these global movements are shifting the landscape and addressing injustice through governance and sovereignty. Born from these discussions are the care principles for Indigenous data governance. The care principles address a need within open data and open science that often fails to Indigenous peoples and our rights and interests. Existing principles within the open data movement, such as FAIR, um, which I'm sure if you're attending this conference, you've likely heard, so findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, they focus primarily on characteristics of data that will facilitate increased data sharing among entities while ignoring power differentials and historical contexts that are often faced by Indigenous peoples. So the CARE principles address Indigenous peoples' rights to collective benefits, authority to control, responsibility and ethics. An excerpt board from a paper published last week entitled Operationalizing the Care and Fair Principles for Indigenous Data uh, by Stephanie Russo Carroll, who sends her regrets today as she could not be with us, um, and her co-authors. So this excerpt says, collective benefit is more likely to be realized when data ecosystems are designed to support Indigenous nations and when the use and reuse of data for resource allocation is consistent with community values. The UNDRIP asserts Indigenous peoples' rights and interests in data and their authority to control their data. Access to data for governance is vital to support self-determination and Indigenous nations should be actively involved in governance of data to ensure ethical reuse of data. Given the majority of Indigenous data is controlled by non-Indigenous institutions, there is a responsibility to engage respectfully with these communities to ensure the use of Indigenous data supports the capacity development, increasing community data capabilities, and strength, strengthening of Indigenous languages and cultures. Similarly, Indigenous ethics should inform the use of data across time in order to minimize harm, maximize benefit, promote justice, and allow for future use. With that, I would like to introduce you all to our wonderful speakers, Ray Lovett, Bobby Maher, Mar Margaret O'Brien, and Ramin Salami. So Fard. Um, and we also have Adrian with us, who is part of um, the presentation that Raman is going to be giving. And so Adrian will be available to answer questions for that presentation um, at that time. I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction of the speakers. Our first presenters are Ray and Bob. Uh, Raymond Lovett is an Aboriginal social epidemiologist at the Australian National University with extensive experience in cohort studies, health service research, um, public health policy development, and health program evaluation. He's also the director of the Mai Kuyari, uh, the National Study of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Wellbeing 
uh, he is a member of the Mayim Nairi Wingara Indigenous State of Sovereignty Collective in Australia, and also a member of GIDA, the Global Indigenous State of Sovereignty. Uh, Bobby is a PhD candidate and a research associate at the Australian National University. Uh, Bobby is an epidemiologist and has an interest in social epidemiology evaluation. Bobby is also a member, along with Ray, uh, Ray of the Mayim Nehru Wangara Indigenous Data Sovereignty uh, Collective in Australia, and again, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. Uh, Margaret O'Brien will be our second presenter and is part of an environmental data initiative and uh, research works with research positive of environmental science data and she will introduce her little, herself a little bit more during her discussion. And uh, Raman, who is our final presenter before we go into a discussion, is a um, software engineer and a research and developing um, in research and developing planning strategies for wireless sensor networks at the University of Duisburg Isen and worked as a creative at the Berlin-based service design agency. And so, um, so we do have three wonderful presentations today. Each presentation will be about 15 minutes and will be followed up by a discussion and a Q&A. I do ask that unless you are speaking that you please turn off your mic and camera so that the screen is uh, clear for um, presentations. Um, if you're noticing that the presentation is very small on your screen, at the bottom of your screen, um, and expand so you can expand your your screens as we go if you're finding that uh, you're hearing some feedback that might mean somebody has a mic on so the if there's on the bottom left of your screen there is a little mic and a camera button and if those are white it means your mic and camera are off if put up green it means they're on so um, yeah I with that I welcome you all and uh, I will turn off my camera and I will Ray take over with uh, their, their, Ray and Bobby take over with their presentation. Thank you much. Uh, everyone can hear me okay, thumbs up? <laughs> yep, great. Um, so thanks for uh, attending the session today. Um, Bobby and I, uh, as Robin alluded to, are going to talk about uh, enacting Indigenous data governance in a national longitudinal study in Australia. So the MyQI study. So I'm the director of that study and Bobby does some work in that study as well. So I'm just going to give a brief outline uh, of the study itself so people have an understanding uh, of what we're trying to do in the study. And then uh, we'll talk about the de development of the Indigenous data governance processes for the study. Um, Bobby will go through each of the Indigenous data sovereignty principles that we apply um, to the management of the data uh, in Australia. So we, we use some principles here that were developed uh, by the Mayam Nari Wingara uh, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective. Um, and then we'll talk, sort of finish up, I'll finish up by talking about um, the data um, or how we enact uh, data governance uh, within the, the um, sorry, the data sovereignty and data governance in the cohort overall. Uh, so I've already been through that. <laughs> um, so the development of the study, uh, so my Kauai is, is my uh, Aboriginal language. Um, um, it's uh, the Nyampa language of Western New South Wales. So for people not familiar with Australia, that's towards the middle of Australia. Um, between the it's on the border of South Australia and New South Wales, um, and in Nyampa, Maikawai just means to follow Aboriginal people over time. Um, so, given that we're following people in the sense of a longitudinal study, that's quite appropriate. We've been working on the development of the study since 2014, with a four to six year development period. So. Um, that included um, developing measures, uh, testing, running focus groups about the types of questions and measures we wanted in the data set. Um, and it's been designed by and led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people the whole way through. So that includes the team working on the development, but also the governance uh, of the study overall. So we've had that in place for quite some time. And that involves, um, uh, it's 10 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peak health um, 
health research and healing organisations uh, here in Australia. And really what the study is trying to do is gather data uh, to examine links between culture and well-being. But in saying that, it has a whole range of other social, cultural, um, socioeconomic, um, employment, um, health data as well. So it says there that it uh, uses a lot of, quant so we have a lot of quantitative measures, but that whole six, four to six year period was a qualitative uh, process where we use focus groups to develop those measures. Um, and as it says there, we've got a range uh, of cultural indicators in the data set as well. So for us, um, uh, how we've conceptualized it um, and some of the aims for the study are to really sort of address deficits in our current national data. Uh, systems that we have here in Australia that our uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics um, uh, usually manages. Um, and it's also focused on prioritising wellbeing concepts that are defined by Indigenous peoples. Uh, so, for example, here um, on this diagram, you can see the kinship and family wellbeing um, module, discrimination and health, the sort of the, uh, relationship there. But we want to be able to look at, well, does cultural factors or kinship factors mediate relationships between, um, you know, exposure to discrimination and racism and health uh, and the health outcome or pathway? So at the moment in our current sort of national statistical institutions, we can't examine these sort of pathways. So the study's really been designed around that. Um, and with that, you can probably see uh, from the way we're looking at um, data, we're really focused on what we call salutogenic approaches or what protects or produces good health um, or, uh, or protects people from uh, negative health outcomes, particularly from a cultural perspective. So it's really important um, and we always talk about these two different kind of concepts when we talk about Indigenous data sovereignty, these two really discrete elements um, in that uh, data sovereignty is really made up um, of data governance or governance of data processes. So that's the control of the data ecosystem, so who's in charge um, and there, therefore who gets to provide the context for the data store story and then the other part of that is data for governance so what do indigenous groups or uh, populations need um, to have a self-determining future so for us when we think about those sorts of things it's about analysis and measuring the impacts of those things that we um, um, that we don't currently look at it's around building data capability within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population here in Australia, but Indigenous people more broadly. So that's capability in terms of people, um, but it also means capability in terms of data infrastructure that are controlled and managed by Indigenous people. And then from that, we are able to think about nation building with meaningful data items, measures and infrastructure um, to do all of those sorts of things. So how we apply IDS in my Kauai is through two processes. So um, we, we uh, look at how uh, my Kauai data are governed. So that's the governance of um, data. And then the second part is priorities for analysis by Indigenous peoples and organisations, our governance group. So that's data for governance. What are our priorities? What data? Um, do we need to prioritise uh, for, for our own nation building here? So um, how we set up uh, our Indigenous, uh, the governance of data in my Kauai was we formed um, a 12 member indige all Indigenous panel uh, that's external to the study um, that assesses uh, applications for data use. So um, while they have a terms of reference um, and those sort of formal documents, um, what, what, how, how that committee was formed um, was that um, it, over a period of 12 months, um, they took the Mayam Nari um, Wingara Indigenous Data Sovereignty Principles um, and formed um, an assessment tool 
uh, that is used when people apply for my QI data. So uh, the committee was formed uh, without any sort of formal processes and the committee themselves developed uh, the assessment process over that 12 month period through a, through a, a few uh, workshops that were held during that 12 months. So as a result of that, you can see on the right hand side of this slide, each step in the process, there's 10 steps um, around people uh, wanting to access and use uh, MyQI data. So the this data gov or governance of data process is now in operation, has been for just over a year. Um, and then I'll hand over now to Bobby just to talk about how um, the MyQI um, uh, principle, uh, MyQI study uses our Indigenous data sovereignty principles. Great, thanks, Ray. Um, so in June 2018, the Mayam Nairi Wingara Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective in Australia was formed. So we held a summit here in um, in Canberra and we also invited some of our Māori native, uh, data sovereignty network um, to come along and attend and share with us um, sort of what they were doing in their space. And through this summit, we actually developed our Australian Indigenous Data Sovereignty principles. Um, so following that summit, um, the Michael Wye Data Governance Committee then pulled those principles apart um, into their elements and they created def definitions for those elements. Um, from the definitions, they then developed criteria as to how they would expect an applicant uh, to address the element uh, when they're applying for access for the, the data from the MyQI study. So what I'll do now is I'll go through the different principles and the elements so you can see um, how that would be perceived in an application form. Okay, so uh, this this refers to uh, the first principle um, and it really relates to the data governance committee for the Michael Y study. So it's really referring to control and care for the data. Then we move into principle two and that's really about making sure the data is broken down into smaller parts. So in Australia, there's over 300 uh, Aboriginal uh, groups and so grouping them all together, it doesn't provide the context for the, the, data, the data story. And then when we move into uh, the principle three here, this is about who decides, what questions are asked from the data, how it includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the process. So some kind of structure in the project um, to ensure accountability and what's left behind for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities. And then principle four is about the information and how it is protected, stored, analysed and disseminated, and also then available for individual community populations. And lastly, our um, fifth principle is about ensuring the way the data is analysed, is about empowering and using strength-based approaches. So the second part of this principle is around national to local priorities and how the project supports these while it'll while it is also protecting the interests of Indigenous people after the dissemination process. So you can see um, from those five principles um, how we uh, apply each of the elements uh, to the assessment process, that committee. And because the committee uh, was um, involved the whole way through, um, they got to decide uh, those assessment processes. So the broader um, other part uh, of the MyQI um, study is around data for governance. Um, so I mentioned uh, these 10 different organisations um, that are involved in governing the study. And so they guide us in, in terms of uh, prioritising the research, evaluation and our knowledge exchange program. Um, so this, this group has been uh, in existence for about four years. 
Um, and so our current sort of uh, priorities, I guess, uh, that that our broader governance group has um, sort of guided us in the work that we're doing going forward is around, um, we developed a lot of new instruments uh, in the development of the MyCoi study. And one of the questions we always get about is around val how valid those instruments and measures are. So we have a whole stream of work around validation of new instruments, uh, particularly cultural stuff. Um, and then um, a really important issue in Australia is uh, we have quite poor data nationally around racism and impacts uh, on well-being. Um, like Canada and other places, we also have quite a history of historical and contemporary trauma. So there's a whole program of work around that. And then there's more um, sort of, I guess, uh, population health-based stuff around tobacco control. Um, and over, over all of those kinds of things is looking at the protective effects of cultural engagement. In terms of evaluation of um, nationally significant program areas, um, again, tobacco control features, uh, preventative health checks are a big um, focus here in Australia, language revitalization process and access, and uh, what we call rangers here in, in, in Australia, but uh, people that work in and care for, in, for country, so environmental health, and then uh, programs that really help family wellbeing or improve family uh, situations. So they're our sort of broader um, uh, data for governance that uh, our governance has asked us to look at uh, as a part of the study for our nation building. Uh, so that, that's pretty much our presentation. Um, I know there was a lot in there and there's a lot around the principles. So we're happy to make those slides available to people. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's it's we're just going to move into our next presentation and then we'll have a discussion about all of this at the end for anybody just getting here if um, you haven't seen I did add a document a Google Doc to the chat if you could click on that add your name and um, your your position if you like really we're just trying to see you know attendees and, and where you're coming from and if you'd like to be contacted in the future for updates or whatever we can add you to the Gita mailing list and um, you can add your email address there and if speakers have any notes could you please add them to that document so that people who might be coming in late can access those and there's also a question section at the very bottom of that document just in case for some reason we don't get to all the questions at least this way you can add some there um, and we get back to you. Thank you. And welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm on. Share screen this one. I think that's working. Starting, maybe. I don't see it yet. <laughs> there it goes. Oh, yes. well, there's Robin. Do you see us? I just yeah. see publishing my desktop. So I see your whole desktop. Um, yeah, the desktop. With, yes. with your presentation on it. So if you. This one. All right. So if I just present, I'm good to go. Now you should see a title slide. Yes? Yes, we do. You do. Okay. It's interesting. I don't. <laughs> no, uh, thumbs up at the bottom and that's All right. Great. All right. We're good. Oh, hello. Thank you for this opportunity. This is actually uh, a, a great place to present, I think. My name is Margaret O'Brien. I work with a research data repository uh, called the Environmental Data Initiative, um, for EDI for short. My own area of expertise is metadata and data curation, particularly for uh, environmental science research data. Um, our repository is a member of the Earth Science Information Partners, which is a coalition of data providers and users. And so I'll be talking to you today about some work that we're doing in ESIP that is examining the care principles. Um, I'm going to get my 
So ESIP links up the functional sectors of observation, research, application, education, and the uses of earth science. So it acts as kind of a brain trust of professional workers, professionals working in earth science, and their vision is to be a leader in promoting the collection and stewardship and reuse of earth science data. Uh, and we also um, want this, all of these activities to be responsive to societal needs. Get this in the right place. There. Um, ESIP is made up of many types of members. Typically, these are organizations that include data distributors, repositories, and archive centers, and providers of products and services. Some of these are commercial. Uh, the sponsors, the primary sponsors, are NASA, NOAA, and the USGS. So we're, we have uh, probably primarily US organizations, but we are international as well. Um, ESIP also includes several collaborative data networks. And so these logos are simply examples. There are over 150 organization mel organizational members um, at ESIP. So the work I'm describing comes from one of the, mostly come from the members on the left. These are the data and information repositories and service providers. Um, and we are operate as a working group, similar to the way an RDA interest group operates. And even within that classification though, there's a lot of diversity. Some of these, uh, groups, organizations create data products for specific audiences, and some, for some, the primary objective is to accept data and disseminate it for reuse without a great deal of control over its content. So our our cluster is called the sustainable data, sustainable data management cluster, and our and we investigate pathways for the sustainable and increased collaboration and coordination among environmental data management systems. We want to benefit both the research networks and individual investigators. And as you can imagine, these systems have all started with a specific mission and goal, and so aligning their practices after the fact is not simple. Our cluster's past projects have focused on mechanisms to improve interoperability and potential value for uh, data services. And our current project is an alignment of some of the sets of recommendations that exist, in particular, the trust, fair, and care frameworks, so that repositories have some guidance as they set priorities for their activities. So our cluster is generally familiar with trust and fair, and even includes some of the authors um, um, of those two frameworks on their papers, or authors of those papers. Um, and we would like, li we likewise would need to have at least a few people who are equally proficient in the care principles to act as a resource for the entire group. And so that brings me to what I'll talk about here, which is our examination of the care principles so that we can provide basic life guidelines to repositories on their engagement with the framework. So I don't think I need to present this to this group. This is an overview of the care principles. It's for reference because later I'm using these uh, uh, index to index our results. So our, uh, now I wanna take a little bit about how a, a data repository works um, because I, I, I think a lot of the um, groups I've been hearing about so far at RDA are data producers with a specific mission. Um, because we're talking about care in the context of research data repositories. So uh, data repositories as a, as a group have some fairly similar goals. It's to publish and archive data from research projects, making that data available for further use. And it's that reuse that drives our third goal, which is to curate data to the most complete level possible and make it reasonably easy to find. So the kinds of services that a repository would offer then are these curation and archive services, as I mentioned. So this is providing forms for collecting and vetting data and their metadata. It also means exposing metadata from our holdings for aggregation and indexing by major search engines and for recording linkages to journals, publications, and provide that information to scholars. Typically, repositories provide cataloging and search through a data portal. And there's almost always an education component to promote good data practice and train um, future data managers and scientists. And most researchers are now used to working with repositories, whether they're depositing data there or using data. So repositories can connect data's, researchers' data to the rest of the world and act as a pivot point. And we think of the trust, fair, and care frameworks as being a triad. The trust framework is mainly about the repository and its operations and infrastructure. 
Fair is mainly about the data itself and care is about the people. And of course they all overlap. So back to our objective, we want to understand care well enough to work those principles into our planned alignment of these frameworks. We use our regular meetings, which are monthly, plus a few targeted sessions to talk about the care principles. And we included guests from the care team um, assembled by Stephanie. She and uh, Maui Hudson were, pre were um, present, present regularly at our meetings with others to lend their expertise. For example, Ibrahim uh, works in public health and bioethics. Um, and this is the list of the people from our cluster. You'll probably recognize some of their names from other RDA activities. Our discussions were really open-ended. We brought up our own experiences, examples, and practices, um, repository related or otherwise. And then after, after this set of about 10 hours of meetings, we went through the discussion notes and pulled out mentions of repository activities. This was the way we actually tried to categorize how we would um, advise groups who are interested in implementing care principles. Um, we categorized them broadly and the goal was that to, to get a sense of where repository activities intersect with care so that those who have data related to indigenous populations can plan their approach. There's a couple of disclaimers here. There are some things that we don't have. First of all, our discussion highlights our discussions with um, Stephanie and that and the Maui's group highlighted the things that the researchers themselves who are collecting data will have to address. And these are not directly related to repositories, except that those researchers are part of our community and we have ways of reaching them. Secondly, repositories generally have very few mechanisms or guidelines for obtaining legal advice. And agencies that fund repositories will have speaking points of their own, and they will want repositories that they support to be aware of these. So we have not addressed either of those kinds of issues here. So um, as we were trying to categorize our activities and how they match up with care, it seemed pretty evident that the care principles were, were general in a sense that they touched on many aspects of our, um, op our repository operations. And we looked for ways to narrow down this material. So these are the broad categories that reflect a breakdown of roles and areas of expertise. Repositories are made up of people with a range of skills. Some will be software developers and creating who create infrastructure. Others are curators and work directly with data producers. And of course, everything that those people do um, overlaps between those categories as well. So um, the order of these is somewhat bottom up from the repository's point of view. Um, since the basis of a repository is its data holdings, first thing we have to understand is that data and the community that comes with it. And then would come protocols and practices that a repository implements. Uh, th then the generally the technical aspects are the culmination of these. Uh, outreach is typically communication with, with new groups who are not already among the depositor community. So it's somewhat orthogonal in that it's kind of performed by everyone although it might lean a little more on the curators than it does on the technical staff. And then there was a group of repository activities that were mixed, that involved, uh, when we consider them in, in light of care, that involved two or more types of these activities, or there were dependencies between them. Um, Sometimes uh, we, just, we thought that there were activities that would actually involve a hosting institution or a community of repositories would need to be involved. So the next slide shows the activities that we identified and categorized by these general classes. Um, I think I want you to keep in mind this is still a work in progress. We'll be working on this throughout the spring and summer and the rest of this year. And we actually have a session, uh, which will be a partly a working session at the ESIT meeting in July. Um, in all, we came up with about 40 repository activities and we are still distilling those. So what I'm going to show you over these next few slides are the, um, the things that repositories do and how they fit into each of these activities or each of these broad groups, these four or five broad groups. And for each one of these, um, we've added the uh, index to the care principle that um, best matches. And I, we're pretty sure that some of these match, well, they match more than one um, principle. So we're gonna have to go back through there. Um, I, I don't wanna read long slides to you. So I'll probably just go through these generally, and then, of course, these slides will be available later. <laughs> 
we're expressing these as suggestions. Um, that's where they all start kind of an, uh, you should or you could engage with indigenous populations, learn enough. So this first group are the topics that a repository might add to their regular channels of communication or with their communities. Um, some of these would take additional effort, especially things like understanding the legal rights and roles as relationships change over time. So this is a list of protocol related activities. Most repositories have protocols of some form, but they may not include material specifically on data from indigenous populations. And these are the activities that are related to communication and outreach. Some of these describe the way in which the protocols from the previous slide could be placed on a website. That's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Some of them are um, facilitating relationships between data and user communities is actually rather complex, this number five. And then these technical, which are probably, in, in my mind, one of the more interesting, um, what is it actually a, a repository that creates a data portal? What are the kinds of things that it has to be able to do in order to implement these kinds of principles? So here you see things like, uh, under, have a, you have to have a, an embargo process where data can be held privately, but it has to be fairly granular. And if you're going to have an embargo process, then you need to have a way of identifying users, but it still has to respect privacy concerns. So it gets, it, it can get actually fairly complex in the technical. I think I have another slide of technical. Yes, it doesn't end there. Um, and then the fourth one, the last one, is actually more complex because these kinds of activities involve more than one of the other four activity areas, very often all of them. For example, a technical solution that can't be started without a community connection and input followed by protocols being established. Probably one like number two, this ensuring due diligence is actually the, could be the responsibility of the reviewer's own review board, and excuse me, of the researcher's review board and a repository's part is to package that documentation with the data. Uh, there's a number eight, a process for, oh, lost my place. Uh, oh, there's too many on here. Oh, the second, no, never mind, never mind. So um, these are also complex in that most of these touch on multiple care principles as well. We've put indexes in there, but I think that probably the list will be expanded. Most of these, as we, as we assign uh, the care principles to them, are going to look like number nine here, which actually involves three, both in the authority to control and in the ethics. So the next steps for us then is uh, first to do a little quality control. We wanna make sure that we have our activities properly categorized and that our indexes to care principles are complete. And then it will be back to our group's objective, which is the alignment of these sorts of activities with our recommendations for trust and fair as well. And a version of this talk will be in our, the uh, introduction to our ESIP session, probably with a little more information, and that'll be in July of this year. And I want to thank you for your time. Uh, back to you, Robin. I'm not sure, do I just stop sharing here? Or do you want to turn me off? There. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. That was great. Again, anybody, if you have questions, add them to the Q&A. Um, and, uh, and we'll make sure to add that to the discussion, which will be happening after Raman's presentation. And uh, so thank you, Margaret. And I will hand it over to you, Raman. Oh, there's two of me. <laughs> thank you, Robin. So I will start about a project that is called Local Indicators of Climate Change Impacts Observation Network. And it's developed at the Environmental Institute for the Institute for Environmental Sciences and Technology in uh, Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain. Um, so our journey actually started uh, with a project called LICHI, Local Indicators of Climate Change Impacts, which is a project funded by the European Research Council. Um, 
And basically the idea is to bring the contribution of indigenous peoples and local communities to, um, to climate change research, basically to um, complement um, our picture of climate change uh, that we that we just get from sensory data or remote sensing. Um, the project started in 2018 and runs until 23. So three of several objectives were to um, develop a standardized protocol for data collection, um, which we already did and published, um, and we trained people on that, um, to, to um, develop an inventory of local indicators of climate change impacts, um, which we also did and published, which is basically something like ontology of, of lychees, and to basically then in the step analysis to identify spatial, socioeconomic, and demographic patterns in uh, climate change impacts. So the data that is basically collected and generated in this project can be um, separated in three different data sources. Uh, one is basically uh, by an extensive literature review of um, papers that basically talk about local indicators of climate change impacts, um, which has already been published and from which we basically developed this uh, ontology of lychees. Um, and then fieldwork by the core team and um, research partners from all around the world. Um, so we, we trained these people with the lychee protocol and uh, gave them the, the ontology and basically they went uh, to fieldwork, which was um, obviously like slightly disrupted by the, by the COVID pandemic. And as a third part, we um, developed uh, or still developing the citizen science platform, which we call OpenTech. So this is for public participation. So it doesn't necessarily involve indigenous people, but anyone who's interested in uh, this kind of data. So the project also follows the care principle. So it's baked into a data management plan. So all publications are open access and the research data is also open access. And we um, plan to guarantee that by um, putting it on the data repository Senodo, which is a data repository in CERN, uh, and also having it on the OpenTech platform. So OpenTech is basically a um, citizen science platform. So it's a web-based participatory platform for geolocalized data. Uh, it's open source. And um, we allow to have like flexible entry types. So we kind of like can represent these three sources of data in their, with their specifics. Um, it's also the languages are extensible since we want to gather data from all around the world. We basically want to allow it to kind of like uh, easily translate it to other languages um, to allow public participations in new languages. Um, and then we already considered some degree of um, data sovereignty for all users of the platform. So people have, well, like keep ownership of their data and the privacy settings are flexible and the license settings are also flexible. And the address is OpenTech EU. So like after looking at that, we kind of like thought about um that this is not going far enough in terms of like um indigenous people rights so the lychee protocol um uses the fpic prior free prior and informed consent but um this obviously doesn't go far enough and it also doesn't integrate indigenous people's values into the protocols or the platform so everything is kind of like um, collected by in the field work with nodes or whatever, but then abstracted so it matches this uh, this ontology, so the data can in the end be compared. Um, so Lichion basically builds on Lichy's work and tries to address these challenges by developing um, IP specific platforms. So the goal is to integrate the knowledge of indigenous people and local communities and climate change policy in a practical, rights-based and policy-relevant manner. 
And basically the initial approach that we are like now planning to do is to adapt the open tech citizen science platform to be useful and relevant for indigenous people's user groups and the CSO, CSOs that represent them. So our current status, still like relatively early in the process, is uh, to establish partnerships with uh, relevant organizations, um, which are all based in South Southeast Asia. Um, and with these organizations, we will co-develop workshops that partner um, that will lead to determine how the new platforms should function and look like, and uh, use their their guidance uh, to develop uh, to 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 um, to yeah have data sovereignty. Um, and also, before starting even these workshops, we are still working on um, modifications on open tech um, that we anticipate will be necessary. So our considerations in order to um, our considerations at the moment is, are to adapt the user experience and the user interface design so it meets the requirements of indigenous organizations and partners and the communities, which might be basically uh, that we consider people with different levels on, of literacy. I will not talk about this consideration, but just about the two next one, which is basically how we want to operationalize the care principles and um, um, considerations about infrastructure, like physical infrastructure. Um, so how do we operationalize care principles? I mean, since we're still early in the project, um, we kind of like, um, start from where we are now. So we have we have already like some mechanisms in the citizen science platform regarding the ownership and the privacy settings, entry access and licensing. But uh, we want to go a step further. So in terms of licensing, we basically want to replace what we're using now, the Creative Commons licenses by using the traditional knowledge and uh, biocultural uh, knowledge labels which basically give indigenous people more uh, authority and uh, well, more authority of, of how the data can be reused. So basically it allows them to add labels right into the metadata of their contributions. Um, and further, we uh, work with individual groups and basically allow them really to decide what data is collected, how it's, how it's collected. Um, also, we plan to make the, the access model a bit more granular, um, inspired by what we have seen with uh, from the uh, content management system Mokutu, um, where basically on each ent entry, at some the, the creator could decide for which particular group uh, the data was accessible. Um, so, and we're also basically doing now these, uh, well, to guarantee that we are operationalize the care principles, we are self-imposing ourselves to do this assessments of how well we uh, follow the care principles. Um, and we have done the first one already. Um, and basically our idea, how we understand this be fair and care principles is that we try to make this platform um, as close as necessary to protect uh, indigenous people's rights, but as open as possible so that um, relevant stakeholders like policymakers or researchers can access and use the data. Um, last, a few comments on like what we think is also crucial in the future, even though it might not be developed in this project, is considerations about the infrastructure, so also the physical infrastructure. And there are basically two different options, right? One is like a centralized infrastructure and then on the opposite side, distributed infrastructures. And of course, it's like, it's gonna be a spectrum in between, but um, for centralized infrastructures, it's basically like, it's easier to implement that, um, but you always have a single point of failure and you have like a single, um, group of governance. So this might make things easy also for, for indigenous people in some ways, because they don't need to manage anything or 
um, they can be sure that their data is kind of like secure and reliant and robustly available. But um, in the end, we see that in order to have full and customizable sovereignty, we need to have, we need our repositories to work in a distributed manner. Um, so basically like centralization, like the easy, easiness of maintenance is just like a convenience, which we eventually need to overcome. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for the attention and you can get in touch with us for any questions for now. Thank you so much, Robin. That was wonderful. Um, so now that uh, we've had all of our wonderful presentations, we do have um, we have 37 minutes actually to have a, a discussion and go a little bit more maybe in depth with all of you. Um, would all the panelists like to join me on camera? Oh. Hi, everybody. So there might be feedback if um, somebody is talking and somebody else has a mic on. You just have to be kind of considerate of that if we're not speaking to please turn off our microphones. And um, so that was really wonderful. I, I find it absolutely incredible to see how um, like the care principles have evolved from just, you know, this, this really wonderful idea that um, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance developed at uh, at an RDA actually um, initially at an RDA I want to say RDA 12 um, but that's just off the top of my head um, but yeah so it's really really interesting to see the uptake around the world and all the different ways that everybody is implementing these we do have a few questions in in the question box and we also have um, like I also have a couple of questions I'm going to start with Ray and and uh, and Bobby I'm curious if um just i i recognize that your project started long before um the care principles were developed and so i know that they you know, were taken into consideration throughout that development process so is there a way that the principles that you uh, bobby that you shared do they do they align in in what ways do they align with the care principles and uh, how would you suggest somebody kind of move forward in in doing what like Margaret shared and, and evaluating um, how care into different spaces based on um, your very specific set of principles that that were part of those conversations in the early days. Um, yeah, I mean, we were listening as Margaret was talking about um, the process of mapping uh, or you know existing kind of processes systems um, that are already present against the care principles so but we work the other way around um, so i was talking to bobby during your presentation that we started with the principles and then how how do we so when we were talking to our development group around the assessment um, it was more about how do we best meet this principle uh, and what are the different elements, which is why we define them out like that. So it was a slightly different process, but we we had the luxury, like you said, Robin, of um, having our principles developed at a time that was uh, important here in Australia. And so we were able to use those um, to assign them to a, a essentially a data repository. And we're only dealing with one, not multiple data repositories. Um, so that was quite a different process, but I can see how mapping back against the care principles is occurring in Margaret's work. Um, uh, that would be a super complicated process, and it sounds like it is. Um, but yeah, we we were very fortunate, I guess, in that we're also involved in developing those principles here in Australia, but also the care principles, which came a bit later as well. So at the time, we didn't have the care principles either. So. Um, but in terms of the Mayam Nari Wingara principles, they do map reasonably well uh, across to care as well. So there's, I think in that publication you mentioned, 
there's a table from across the different Indigenous data sovereignty networks about the principles we've all developed and they're sort of mapped against the care principles. Uh, so they, they're all closely aligned, I think, um, North America, Australia, and also New Zealand. So. And I think also like with the application form, we really want people to think about how they can demonstrate, you know, what they're trying to do with the data in the project. Um, so that that's a really important component, not just saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're doing, you know, we're applying these particular elements um, in the project. Like it's important for them to be able to demonstrate, you know, the how of that for um, the assessment process. Yeah, I think ours is a much more applied process, I guess, yeah. compared to the other two. You, you're still on your journey, whereas we're now at a, in a space where we've mapped them. Um, we've got definitions and assessment processes. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, it's really, really incredibly interesting to see uh, you know, where data sovereignty and indigenous have come and where they're going. And um, Margaret, in terms of um, the the work that you shared, so there is a question here that is very similar to one that I was going to ask. So Adrian from the Lichion group uh, with Raman is wondering if the self-assessment method on needing care, um, Margaret, I think more specifically, if they're public or if they're if they're shared, um, and just just to help kind of move that uh, conversation forward, I guess, uh, I'm imagining many, many people are trying to find ways of um, mapping backwards, I guess, to the care principles, as you say, Ray. Um, and I'm curious, how did you do that? How, like, was there, you mentioned um, your engagement process and the conversations you've had with Steph and Maui, were they pr part of the, the deciding what factor equaled what um, and is there is there a process that you took to making um, those decisions? Are, are you asking? Yeah. Oh, so, so <laughs> the process, the, uh, the the process is really just talking a lot. Um, we we just since, since well since our group had was we, we had very little exposure to care before we read Stephanie's paper. Some of us know that the repositories that we work with, um, we know that they contain data that is applicable or where care would be applicable. Um, and so we shared lots of stories actually um, with people uh, like our, we have one of, one of our members works with the Arctic. And of course there's many um, uh, uh, nations and populations up there. Um, and so our basic approach was was just to share the problems that we were having so far that we knew existed. Um, as far as how we mapped them, so we, we took pages of notes. <laughs> um, and then the, the most of the work was going back, it's, and it's still going on, um, is going back through those notes and saying, oh, this is a this is a thing we were talking about you know, a two for example and here's a thing that repositories do and it came up during the discussion of a two so it applies um, and and what we so that's how kind of how we picked these things out um, it's 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 still incomplete um, I want to keep <laughs> making that point and we're not done um, because we suspect that that kind of an activity also has ethical considerations or something else will probably also go along with it. And that's the, the it's, it's pretty interesting. And you know, the same thing happens with fair and trust. These frameworks, like most policies are written um, to be very general and the, the details of how you actually implement a policy are pretty complicated. Um, figuring out which parts of your operations it actually touches on. Is this a, mostly a communication thing? Is it mostly a technological thing? If you're simply talking about access to data, it's uh, the biggest problems are probably technological, but figuring out what that access is supposed to be, that's communication. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, part of the question was, will this be public? And the answer is yes, everything that ESIP does is public. Um, 
And actually, the even though it's an organization of, of member, or it's, it's, an, it's a coalition of member organizations, we have plenty of people who come to the meetings and join the working groups who are not uh, formally affiliated with ESIP. So you're welcome. Please come along. If you have an interest in earth science data, it would be great. Um, the link on the, my last slide is, a, is our wiki page, which has all the connection information, um, or you can just contact me. Wonderful. Would you say then, Margaret, that applying the care principles it would was the process for the work that you're doing uh, different than when you look to apply the fair and trust principles? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yes, I'd say it's a little bit. I think there's probably more dis more discussion um, because well, the fair principles. I've been involved in in implementing fair principle checking as well and those tend to be smaller more technical conversations because we'll be looking at uh for fair you want to look at a specific metadata element <laughs> whereas for care it's more about the protocol and how you approach it so um there's because there's people involved in care more than there are i would say people involved in um these really specific data aspects so yes, it is more different. It is different. There's more more communication has to happen. I think. Thank you. Thank you. So again, everybody, if you have any additional questions, um, them to the Q and A, and we'll make sure to uh, address those as we go. Raman, I'm curious if um, what, what of challenges and successes are you facing as you make your way through this journey of trying to find a way i guess adopting care into the work that you're doing um well i mean we see that um that the that the key tk labels and the bc labels are quite crucial um but so far it's like we don't know like how open the communities that we're working in will be uh, to kind of develop these these labels because it takes time. And um, we don't know yet if those people who are basically don't don't so are not, not so technological as as all of us basically manage um, how the how the data will basically be reused in the in the life cycle so basically if a protocol says okay you actually have to request access or you have to um you have to report back what you do with the data those this this needs people to actually like look at the notifications or requests and always like respond to that um so far yes but so we also like hoping at the like the release of the um waiting for the release of the local context sub, which will basically help communities in uh, developing these labels. That's great. Maybe Adrian has something to it as well, actually. Yeah, Adrian, hi. You're welcome to join in this Q&A discussion for sure. Thanks, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm hopping on on, on uh, Stephanie's account, but uh, also from the Lucian program, so her voice did not change. Uh, <laughs> and um, well, I, I'm just to tag on to this uh, this point of the TK and BC labels. One of the first uh, questions that I had uh, when I first spoke with Maui and and, uh, um, and Jane Anderson about these labels was, you know, what what are the legal um, what's the legal backbone to these labels and and they said something to me that was very i think liberating which is which is what which is that essentially there is none there is no legal backbone to, the, to these labels and it's it's a problem um that is happening between the the the, the 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 individual providing the data and the user using the data um and with that i mean robin you asked what kind of opportunities you see ahead and, and i saw it as a challenge originally that there's that there wouldn't be sort of a, a legal ramifications for misuse of data, but in the end, um, these labels allow for a really whole 
new way of looking at what is information or what is knowledge in a, in a virtual or a cyberspace. And um, that was really, I, I'm trying to see that as an opportunity for us. So um, but in terms of the challenge, there are, there are plenty, obviously. And um, I'm, I mean, I, I, one of the questions that I'm seeing here was also on, on, um, on, on our self-assessment tool. And I just wanted to add to this because Margaret uh, has mentioned hers, uh, Ray, uh, I think also shared, um, shared theirs, their assessment against the principles. Um, and for us, it's been, it's been also some type of reverse mapping to some extent, but um, we uh, uh, ultimately looked at the, uh, the, the, the principles themselves and um, put together all of our content and a bit like a bit like you would do pretty simple qualitative research or qualitative coding um, you, we essentially just ended up categorizing right these uh, within each within each um, within each uh, principle so uh, c1 c2 etc and um, uh, the uh, our res uh, we sort of we sort of organized it in, in into four different sections. One of them was a response to how we actually meet each principle, um, uh, or don't meet because in many cases we st we obviously don't meet them. Um, so it's also a work in progress. Uh, and then the second category was the current status. So if we if it's even in our plans to be able to meet this principle. Um, if, if we are in implementation mode or if that's actually been achieved. Um, the third category was potential issues uh, that we foresee with, with actually being able to meet um, uh, the principles. And then after that is any, any other notes that we had. So it's, I think, I think in, this, in this field, we're also uh, completely learning. We, we're, completely, we're, we're students, right, of this, of this, of this work. So we are, Got a lot to learn, and thankfully, there's folks like the, the, the care team that is uh, that is helping us guide. Thank you. You're welcome to stay on the on this, you know, as part of this Adrian. Um, so there is another question here. Actually, what kind of assessment at at Raman, What kind of assessment did you do, and are there care assessment tools available? Uh, well, I mean, I guess Adrian just outlined that a bit, right? So we basically went through the all the points of the care principles and then looked at our framework and how it applies it. So basically, just out of our head. So no, no framework used. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in during this conference, there's been many discussions around uh, data repositories, mainstream implementing the FAIR principles and, um, and other, you know, other sorts of um, guiding principles. And so like uh, Core Seal Trust and uh, World Data System and, and these other kind of big name repositories that are presenting that the last couple of days here at the RDA. I'm just curious, what sorts of um, what sorts of advice would you give a data repository system thinking about Indigenous data sovereignty? And this is kind of just goes out to all of you. Um, I, I, you know, just what kinds of in steps could people take in in starting this journey? You know, Raman, you're at a you're at one stage of this journey. Margaret, you're at another. Raymond. Bobby, you're at another, um, you know, so for people who aren't even at a point where they're starting to discuss Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous, looking at things like the care principles, what advice would you give? I could start. <laughs> So basically, I mean, I, I really love the Margaret, the, the, this Venn diagram that you showed. And basically, since the care principles are like from a user centered perspective of data, we basically need to make more use of, um, of uh, like global and unique uh, actor identifiers. So identifiers of people and formal and or non formal organizations, because basically, 
Um, and in that sense, this is probably like, because in the fair maturity, it's, it's, all, it's all about these kind of like global and unique identifiers, right? But in order to basically easily have people's interaction on, on these kind of repositories, you need to have a global user account basically, right? So it's all about um, making making uh, use of existing protocols like OAuth, um, for example, using Orchid wherever possible. So somebody can basically identify easily and then only then it's really possible to work on something that's kind of like easy authorization because somebody is like identified as a person from a specific institute. Um, and then we can also have something maybe like, um, I don't know, like, like reputation system where you have like institutes, groups have a specific reputation of like how kind of like aligned they are with care principles, and, like how trustable they are. I mean, don't, don't trust in the blockchain. <laughs> also, blockchain is not like, I hear this, I heard this like in several kind of like discussions, sessions, that it popped out every other day or something like a blockchain. But in the end, like we should, before jumping off the, on this hype chain, kind of like think of the, the real added value that it gives compared to kind of the, the added complexity that it, that it brings. And it's kind of like, in most cases, actually, if you really just think of what you want to achieve, it's probably not necessary because, um, you know, if you have your server somewhere in a university or an institute that you trust, then kind of like that's better than just like having untrusted cryptographic uh, math that, you know, you can't reverse, right? I don't know, there's a lot to discuss about this, but um, I don't know, I wanted to throw this out at some point. I appreciate that, Raman. Blockchain is actually a conversation that I'm trying to um, understand a lot, a lot better because it is popping up where, um, especially like Indigenous nations are looking at blockchain as a potential alternative to infrastructural repositories. But um, I think that for sure there's a conversation to be had around the, I guess, utopian claims of a, a system that I think this week was a news announcement that the unhackable has been hacked. And so when it comes to things like health information, to put that onto a blockchain with the potential of that in mind by somebody else and hacked and, and even though it's not supposed to, you know, there, there's definitely some discussion to be had there. Um, at what sorts of steps, um, I, I'm, I'm curious about that moment in time where, where a, a you know, non-Indigenous repository says, we have Indigenous data and we need to protect it. Um, and, and so for spaces that are holding mainstream and Indigenous data, what, what advice would you give or what moment, what was the trigger for you? What kinds of learnings can we deliver to, um, non-indigenous mainstream type data spaces that are holding indigenous data and say hey how um how can we how can we protect indigenous data that moment where where things change and that's kind of just to the room to anybody who's who's interested in answering um or interested in that discussion because i think that's a that's a point in time where um yeah Oh, Adrian, go ahead. Uh, my, my microphone is on, but I mean, if Ray and Margaret or, or Bobby have uh, would like to go, then please feel free. Otherwise, I do have. I mean, it's a, it's a great discussion to have, but um, I think they probably have a bit more experience than, than we do. Oh, I I don't think I don't think experience is quite the right word. <laughs> We're just getting started on it, and it. Um, I think for us, what having having this kind of um, guidelines would will help a lot. That um, because as a repository, because now I have I'm putting my other hat on now, where I'm actually um, part of this remote repository management team. Um, when when there's a directive to say um, you know implement care, um, 
which is very broad and uh, I don't want to say nondescript, but nonspecific, we'll ha- we will take a set of guidelines and say, okay, one of them is have a way to uh, uh, granular embargoes. So just the idea that you can embargo at all is um, n- not all repositories can do that. So if that's something that's going to be required, I think a, a repository would have to understand, uh, have to examine its its technical infrastructure and see if there are, are things it should be adding. Um, they'll have to they'll have to work it out, work it work it into a, a plan. Um, so that's more than it's. It, there, these are not usually things you can just turn a switch, flip a switch, and turn on. There would have to be um, planning for um, uh, you know additional coding. Uh, there's lots of activities. I mean that takes people, uh, you know, repository people. Um, so the planning process could actually be years to get those things done, given the way that b- budgets for a repository evolve. They usually are. You know, at minimum, what three to five years that they go, and then some are longer. But things things are pretty much cast. I don't want to say cast in stone, but they're pretty well established for that period of time, just because of the way funding agencies work. Is that budgets don't change quickly. So how do you how do you work in a new set of principles that has actions like that in in the space of something that's ongoing? Um, the other is that actually I think is maybe probably more complex, more complex. I mean, those um, activities would be the things that a repository would be doing anyway, in some sense to keep their software up to date. They would always be planning changes to software. And so working in new, um, you know, new, new kinds of infrastructure upgrades, whatnot, those happen kind of continuously. And they're always looking down the road a few years. The more interesting one I think is dealing with the researchers, dealing with them, communicating with the researchers who are our communities of depositors, um, because they all have relationships with their own institutions and their own data collection protocols that we aren't really involved in. We are kind of happen at the end of the research chain. And a lot of these issues actually have to be addressed much earlier. And I'm not sure whether the repository is the right place for that to happen, that communication, or whether it's the universities that need to become involved and how they assess the same way that they assess data or research projects that have to do with human subjects. How do they, how do they handle um, research projects that are um, related to indigenous populations? Um, I've, got, I've got a slightly different bent um, on this. So one of the things we've been advocating in Australia um, is around the esta- establishment of a, of a nation's or national indigenous uh, repository, um, because that would help um, with some of the issues, but of course uh, that's quite a technical feat. Um, but also that would still have to come with uh, indigenous data governance processes. Um, so that involves things like, that we don't really talk about much, is data repatriation to nations um, and those sorts of things. So, um, and of course, uh, all those issues that Margaret just raised um, uh, come up in that process as well. So who collected that data, say if it was 50 years ago, and what sort of access protocols have they set if it's sitting in some repository somewhere, like I know some here in Australia, um, where, you know, Aboriginal families, um, there's heritage data in there, um, but the access protocols are for the non-Indigenous researchers' family. They're, they're the only ones that can make decisions about data. Um, the other way, the other work that we've been doing as well is thinking about, well, how do we apply Indigenous data governance processes or for Indigenous data in other repositories. So, um, um, because uh, there's a sort of bit of a runaway train at the moment as well about government, particularly governments and other institutions here talking about Indigenous data sovereignty, but not really enacting it. So there, there's some sort of cover going on saying, oh yes, we're, we're heading down this path, but we're gonna continue to do what we've always done anyway. We're just gonna call it this. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um you know we we're trying to design um you know or map back again the principles that we've talked about and how 
uh, mainstream organisations and governments in particular might be able to address those principles to apply to themselves um, and setting up similar sort of data governance groups, um, you know, for large data holdings in particular, or where Indigenous peoples have decided um, what data sets need to have Indigenous data governance. Mm -hmm. So those are prioritised. Um, so we have a list of particular data that need to have that governance. So there, there are a couple of things that are going on here. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to, to add kind of some of the things that I know um, from a Canada perspective here. We have, um, so in, in Canada, if you're unfamiliar, there are three distinct groups of Indigenous people. We have First Nations like myself, Inui, and Métis, and within each of those there are um, many, many, many other tribes and, and nations. And so um, the it, between groups, um, there's perspectives and everybody's kind of on their own, their own Indigenous data governance, data sovereignty path. So um, in Canada, a single Indigenous data repository isn't something that um, I don't think would ever, would ever come to fruition. But there are governing bodies across the country in the nations that um, are enacting different sorts of uh, I guess data repository type governance. So we have the First Nations Governance Center, who, um, if you're familiar with data sovereignty on a global landscape, you've likely stumbled across the uh, First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession. And, and in those, um, those stem from the First Nations Information Governance Center's work. And they are a political um, kind of steward for data that belongs to specific nations that fall under their their jurisdiction that that have agreed to be part of those conversations which is um you know one way that our data is being being stored and and actively governed by our individual nations and in other instances we have larger groupings of nations that may be 20,000 people and they've decided we want to have our own uh our own repository um, and in, you know, they might be provincial, they might be, but ultimately, uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of work happening and it feels very much like everybody is at, at their, their own path on, on their own step on their own path towards data governance. And, um, I completely agree with repatriation for Indigenous nations who choose to be, like to have their data repatriated in some cases, nations, um, don't don't always think ahead of to those to those kinds of conversations not all of our nations are anyways and um so it's it's from the perspective of the work that i do i'm realizing you know we need to talk to our our nations we need to communicate because i think uh, a lot of cases people are unaware of the way our data is being used the way our data is being stored um you know the potential that our data is being traded and sold and the policies um, and frameworks here in, in Canada that protect uh, citizen data, everybody's data, um, don't always cover uh, data that are held in repositories outside of our country. So if it's a data repository in the States, it's not protecting our data here. And because of the um, tarnished relationship um, in Canada from, you know, years and years of colonization, uh, the federal government still maintains control over Indigenous First Nations specifically, First Nations in new health data. And so that data, um, even in cases where nations believe that they have control, ownership, access, and possession of that data, it's still being freely d distributed by the governments that hold that data at, at I guess it's, you know, place of origin in in the the world of data infrastructure but um i think it's important to consider when you are if for anybody here who's considering you know we want to we want to look to the care principles we want to adapt the, adopt these into our own protocols that it's about more than adopting just the care principles and it's about really ensuring that the longevity of the future of data is um is secured. So I, I sometimes think, well, what happens if, um, you know, that specific head of that 
department who's very, very rooted in anti-colonial views. What happens when that person is no longer in that that position of a CEO? Um, so what, you know, some of the spaces that I work in, I really, really work to embed policies a culture of decolonization throughout the entire institution and in and, you know so it's about educating and training and ensuring that your people are on the same page as well so that even when somebody does go to access that data and in some cases uh, you know like a data repository that is respectful of indigenous data and indigenous sovereignty um, might not have all of the indications of this data equals indigenous people but some people could very easily say, oh, but I know that this entire postal code region consists of First Nations. And, you know, well, I'm just going to ask for that postal code region. And so you're reporting on Indigenous lives without actually having gone through the process of engaging and making sure. So um, and I think of those things and those kinds of uh, like side sideways ways that some um, people who are not fully engulfed in decolonization and not fully like efforting toward that advance Indigenous priorities and Indigenous rights and interests. Um, I think about those and I think, you know, we really need to make sure that we are embedding a culture of decolonial systems so that in 20 years from now, in 30 years from now, in 100 years from now, um, whoever is in the um, the position of having that data in their systems that they they still continue to recognize that those policy protocols are fluid in favor of the nations with whom they represent. Um, we have a minute and a half left before end of everything and I'm not sure if anybody has anything else that they would like to add but I would like to say thank you Chimiguetch, Chimiguetch to all of you for joining us here today, Chimi Gwech, Raman, Raymond, Bobby, Margaret, and um, um, everybody, all the participants, Adrian as well, who, who joined us, and all the participants, and I hope that you all have a, a wonderful rest to your day, night, evening, some of you may be going to bed. Uh, this has been really great. <laughs> so Chimi Gwech, and uh, have yourselves a wonderful day. Does anybody want to say goodbye? Final words? No? Bye. <laughs>